Uh, my name is Guy Palumbo. Uh, I uh, was an ROTC student at Fordham University. When I graduated in June of 1964, four days later I was on the way and was at Fort Bragg, North Carolina as a second lieutenant. I was assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division when I arrived. Um, during the first year, basically, I attended various required infantry officer schools, the infantry officer basic course. I attended uh, the Airborne School at Fort uh, Benning and the nine-week ranger course uh, also at Fort Benning. When I returned from that eight, nine months of training, officer training, I was back at the 82nd Airborne Division, the 1st Battalion, 504th Infantry of the 1st Brigade, 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, when I arrived, about three, four weeks later, President Johnson called up the 82nd Airborne Division uh, to go to the Dominican Republic. A lot of people don't know that existed or that happened, but uh, we deployed to the uh, Dominican Republic, uh, Santo Domingo, and uh, my unit and myself stayed there for 16 months. Uh, upon completion of that, the whole division went back to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Uh, when I was in the Dominican Republic, I took over the command of uh, Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 504th Infantry. I was the company commander uh, for a little, almost 12 months, which included both the Dominican Republic and returning to Fort Bragg. After I had given up the company, which was almost 12 months, uh, I was then assigned to a company a battalion that was being organized uh, to deploy to Vietnam. That battalion was called, was designated the 3rd Battalion, 503rd Infantry, to join the 173rd Airborne Brigade, which was already in Vietnam. Uh, I deployed as the Battalion S2, um, and arrived with the advance party in um, Quinh Yan and Tui Wah, uh, and that's where the brigade at the point was located. When I arrived first in Vietnam, I had flown with the advance party from uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, with a C-130 plane across the country, all the way, Hawaii, stopped a couple of times in the States, Hawaii, and then into Vietnam directly, while well, the troops were being deployed generally speaking by transport ships. So with the advance party in the C-130 plane, it was a long trip with the same plane, uh, changed pilots several times. <laughs> we arrived at Quinyan and then uh, immediately were picked up and brought to uh, An Ke, which was a large base operation. When I first arrived there, <clears throat> it was confusing. It was a total loss. We had areas set up for to prepare for the troops when they came, which would be about two or three weeks later. Uh, totally lost, totally confused. My assignments when I arrived in Vietnam, I deployed as the S2, which was the intelligence officer. I was responsible for the intelligence, uh, both before we deployed from the Fort Bragg, uh, in developing what kind of a situation we were going in, what was known uh, enemy activity and so on, realizing that by the time we got there, it very well would have changed. Uh, when I got there, we were initially uh, preparing for the troops. So I was catching up on what was going on, where we might deploy initially, uh, where what units or enemy activity we could expect or anything particular. Uh, the 173rd Airborne Brigade at the time I arrived was split. There was two battalions at the time. One We were the third battalion. Uh, Ultimately, there was a 4th Battalion that joined. But one battalion was over in what's called Dak To, Play Ku, Play Morang, western border, close towards the Cambodian uh, border. The other battalion was located at Tuiwa, which was south of where we were initially for the base camp to bring the troops in and get them organized. Uh, I was the intelligence officer. However, since the brigade was split, uh, I was actually operating in the brigade headquarters for my battalion headquarters. So I was, here's the brigade headquarters and here's my battalion and I was in the brigade headquarters working and doing, half of my work was 
the battalion half of it was brigade work. But it was always intermingled. Uh, at some point, I don't remember the exact date, I'd have to go pull up my efficiency reports uh, to find it, but at some point I was actually assigned as the assistant S3 for the brigade for air operations. And that was basically responsible for uh, helicopters, uh, troop transports, uh, and the assignment, depending upon what assaults and what kind of activity they were doing, uh, to prepare and make sure that the right numbers, the right combinations, and whatever were needed for the movement of the troops. While in the battalion uh, at the brigade headquarters, and after being assigned to the brigade headquarters, I was taken from the battalion and assigned to the brigade headquarters. Uh, at that location, I got to work with the other battalion commanders, even though I was not at that level, but the information and coordination course of the split of the brigade, I wasn't the ranking person, but I was a key person, not a key person, but aware person of what was going on. I worked with the other battalion commanders, and one of the battalion commanders at that time was Lieutenant Colonel Buckner. Uh, Colonel Buckner asked me, uh, he wanted me to come to his battalion and work with him. Uh, he wanted me to be on his staff and to be his S3 or operations officer. Uh, I told him, obviously, the general would have to assign me because it's not my place to just quit and say, I'm gonna go work for another battalion. Um, I said, I really wanted to command the company. I said, because I had commanded a company in the Dominican Republic and at Fort Bragg, the same company, and I wanted to command the company in Vietnam. That was one of my career objectives. Um, and uh, he said, I would only promise you 90 days. Knowing the conditions in Vietnam, 90 days could end up being six months. So I said yes. I was assigned as the company commander of Alpha Company, 3rd Battalion, 503rd Infantry. Uh, and during those 90 days, I, I did serve with my 120 odd troop soldiers. We were west of an area called Tuiwa, which was close to the coast. Uh, and there was a mountain range that began there. If, if people remembered, uh, there was a famous thing, and they show you the fall of Vietnam, uh, the Highway of Sorrows, they called it. The Highway of Sorrows, that whole highway, uh, we were responsible for that highway for several weeks. Uh, for demonstration purposes of showing the Arvin, the uh, army of the Vietnam, South Vietnam, had control over the province and the area. Uh, and we, my company, uh, was responsible for maintaining that road open. Ultimately, when Saigon fell, everybody saw all these thousands of people going down the highway. It was called the Highway of Sorrows. That was the same highway. No, I was not wounded, thank God. Uh, while I was at the battalion headquarters, uh, I was in several helicopters. I was with both the battalion commanders and the uh, aerial observers. Uh, and uh, on two occasions, we were shot down. Uh, nobody was, nobody lost their life. I believe one of the people, if I remember correctly, uh, was injured, but nothing serious. Uh, the helicopters eventually did get rescued and taken off and nobody was lost of a life. Apparently the Vietnamese VC, North Vietnamese, don't know who, which one it was, had shot at the helicopter and damaged it so that it had to land. It could not continue flying. Uh, even though I was with the 173rd Airborne Brigade, uh, we didn't jump in Vietnam. The jump that was famous in Vietnam was conducted by the 2nd Battalion and that was done before we ever arrived, before I ever arrived in Vietnam. And that was done, I think that was Operation Junction City, they called it. That was done in the south part of Vietnam before they moved up further north where we were located. How did I feel when the helicopter was shot down? I felt, as I say, uh, really shitless. I was really scared to death. I didn't know what was happening. Uh, I could tell that they obviously the helicopter was hit. Uh, the pilot was giving a mayday over the radio uh, and there's a, a, a trick, uh, not a trick, I'm not a pilot, but a helicopter pilot can do what they call an auto rotation. 
An auto rotation, as I understand it, is like reversing the, the propeller, or the, 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 the rotor rather, uh, as you're going down so that instead of crashing, you almost like get a last minute lift. Uh, I believe that's what was done. Uh, we did have a hard landing, but it wasn't, no, but like I said, only one person I remember was injured. Uh, what else happened, what else, my own adventures <laughs> uh, in Vietnam as far as uh, operations. Uh, at one point, uh, after I had given up the company that I was promised for 90 days, <clears throat> I was moved to battalion headquarters. Uh, and at the battalion headquarters, uh, that's when these two incidents happened while I was at the headquarters, not when I was on the ground. Uh, my old company, company Alpha Company, uh, we were over by the Cambodian border, and one night it was overrun, literally. Uh, my replacement as the company commander was killed, two other officers were killed, and I don't remember how many other troops were killed. Um, it was, they were decimated. Uh, I went, asked Colonel uh, Wayland, Colonel Wayland was the battalion commander, the uh, new battalion commander, <laughs> um, that I wanted to extend my tour of duty for another six months, but I wanted to take over my old company, if you would allow me to do it. Uh, he actually probably saved my life in many ways. The colonel said, no, he said, he said, you've already been shot down twice, you're not taking the third strike. And said, I won't let you extend. He says, I won't give you the company back. And with that, I uh, finished my tour three or four weeks later, I don't remember the exact dates, and came back to the States. Well, strange how things happen. Uh, when I did, when he told me no, when the Colonel said no, I was a little bit upset, uh, but by the same token, I understood. Uh, it was interesting what happened with that same Colonel years later. Years later, Colonel Wyan became the chief of the volunteer army which was putting into place changeover from having the draft to having all volunteer army. And he had now gotten that time, and he was, a, he was, a, he was a full colonel at the time on the list for promotion to general. Uh, and he had called me from the Pentagon and asked me if I would come back in on active duty because I had gotten out and was in the reserves. Uh, and I said, Colonel, I said, sir, I, it's now my turn to turn you down. <laughs> And he remembered that, he remembered that. The morale of the troops that I was with, the 173rd Airborne, and uh, Airborne has a little bit different personality to it, uh, customs, traditions, uh, reputation, good and bad. Uh, I did not see a, the, a problem of morale. Now, I was there only for a year. Uh, but as far as morale and, and, and performance, what always surprised me when I came home and years later, when people were saying things about you being baby killer, you were smoking marijuana, you were taking drugs and everything else. I can say this for, for a fact, that in the 173rd, when I was with the 173rd, and for the best of my knowledge, even after I left, there wasn't a problem with drugs. We were in the woods, we were in the bush, and you don't want the guy next to you smoking pot, doing drugs, when your life depends upon it. And I, like I said, I had never seen it. Uh, it. It may have happened later. I don't know if anybody else could say it happened to our unit. But my feeling is that those people who, most of the people, I would say, who were involved with the drugs, supposedly, were in base camps, what we call rear areas or large fire bases. I can't see troops in the field, in the woods, counting on the guy next to you doing drugs. I would say, if it happened in the 173rd, I wouldn't have been, I would, have, would not have been surprised if some one of those troops didn't get a beating from somebody else. But I never saw it, and I never had that problem. And I didn't know of any problem in the 173rd Airborne Brigade while I was there for a year. Never heard an incident. 
I, I, I remember, as far as remembering what was going on in the States, and everybody was saying, well, the troops over in Vietnam were, you know, being... Uh, that could have probably happened later on. Uh, I was there during Tet Offensive. Uh, I, I was not there during the 70s, uh, 70 through 72, uh, or that time. That's when I think more of the problems were more prevalent or more noticeable. I only remember seeing one newspaper article, and I think it was the Stars and Stripes, uh, which showed some sort of distress or some sort of demonstrations in the States. I never, I, I know when I came back from Vietnam, yes, that was all over the news, and then I, if I went back, I would have probably been aware of it, but I didn't go back for a second tour. I was ecstatic that I was coming home. Uh, it was great. Getting off the plane, uh, and seeing my wife, and then seeing what other friends. But it was then I got a sense of, of embarrassment. You were looking at people, or people were looking at you, and later on you know, I would hear the word, you know, baby killer, you know, uh, druggy, and it was depressing. Um, it, it was not, I, I didn't expect to come home and march down the streets of New York with a ticket tape parade. Uh, I thought that would happen <clears throat> at some point at the end of the war and people would have a parade. Never happened. Um, the, uh, it, it was later on uh, as I stayed, well, as I was in New York and going and doing other things, uh, the demonstrations and it was getting to the point of just turned it off. Don't want to hear it, don't want to see it. Have I gone to the Vietnam Memorial? I didn't go initially, and I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of vets, Vietnam vets, probably, I don't know for sure, but it was my reaction, is that a lot of them didn't go initially. Some of them did, but I don't think as, as many have. Uh, I've gone there two or three times, at diff different times, and every time I go, I go to a certain panel, and I have a problem with that, because there's three names on that wall uh, that I feel are my responsibility. Uh, Sergeant Sisler and Private Bell, when I commanded uh, the Alpha Company for those 90 days, uh, they were killed. And I always wondered if I told them, if I had given them instruction to go left 25 feet or right 25 feet, or go this way as opposed to that way, go straight, uh, they were killed by booby traps. Uh, and their names are embedded in my, my mind. Uh, the other one was uh, Lieutenant Bledsoe. Uh, Lieutenant Bledsoe was my artillery officer when I was the company commander. And we had stopped and we were given a stand down for uh, two days, which was like a little rest, recuperation kind of thing. Uh, you were in a base camp, you didn't have to go out in the woods. And during that stand down, there was a, a firefight, a major battle going on someplace else. And uh, the artillery commander asked me uh, that he, if I would let Lieutenant Bledsoe go to go help out there, which I could have easily said no, because he was mine, he was assigned to me. Uh, he didn't really direct me, he just said, hey. And, I asked Lieutenant Bledsoe, and he said uh, he'd like to go because he really wanted to get into some real heavy action. And I let him go. And the next day he was killed. And it's always that second guessing, just like Sergeant Sisler and Private Bell. Go left instead of right, go straight instead of zigzag or whatever. If you said or did something, you waited 30 minutes, waited an hour, go earlier, go later. You always question that in your mind, that I do the right thing, but whatever I did, they're dead. I, I, I don't know if I saved people. I know that on a personal basis, uh, as far as the combat that I was in with my company, I never fired my rifle in anger. I never fired my rifle, didn't have to. I had troops doing it, I was directing them. But on a personal basis, I never fired my weapon in Vietnam except when we had what's called a turkey shoot. Turkey shoot was we'd line everybody up, there was nothing going on, and clear out your weapons, burn off old ammunition, clean out your gun, etc. 
It was a turkey shoot. You weren't shooting turkeys, you were shooting out in the air. What do I think people should know or remember? I think there's a, there's a, people seem to think it's a big scar on America and on the troops. Uh, yes, it is to an extent a wound, but I think the scar should have been well healed by now. Uh, what, did we do the right thing? Everybody who was in Vietnam was there. And like the greatest generation, as they referred to World War II, <clears throat> I recognize the greatest generation, but to me, everybody who served in Vietnam was also a great generation. They did it. We didn't lose any battle. We lost the war, and I don't want to say we lost because of the politics and the demonstrations at home. That's part of our country. That's the way it's supposed to be. You agree or don't dis or agree with it, but don't hold the troops responsible for political decisions because they are the instrument of political action. It's hopefully the last resort of political action be that as it may, but when it does happen, don't fault them. An individual may do something wrong, like Lieutenant Kelly, or somebody like that who does a particular incident. Yes, and that person can and should be held accountable, whatever it might be. But don't hold everybody. Don't keep them as if they were all baby killers and doing drugs. I think we have learned a lesson. I know that when um, Desert Storm happened. I remember having been down at the Pentagon at the time when it happened. When General Schwarzkopf had completed the run across the desert and did what he did in 100 hours uh, when they stopped him, um, in the Pentagon there were signs hanging off the doors. People were putting signs on their doorknobs saying, thanks Norm, thanks Norm, VN is over meaning we've gotten over that hump. I remember those handwritten signs hanging off the doors. Coming back from Vietnam, as far as what normal life meant to me, or adjustment to it, um, everybody at some point who returns from true combat, uh, I'm not talking about people, I'm not denigrating anybody at this point, but you could be in the war, but not in the war, if you know what I mean. You could be way back in the rear and never even have to have, carry a rifle. Uh, but those who are out in the war, who see the blood, who see the broken bodies, the dead children, the dead enemy, the dead friends, or bleeding, losing an arm, has an element of post-traumatic stress at some point in their life. It may not come out right away. It may come out 10 years later, may come out in a year later, may come out 30 years later. But there is something deep down that they have. As far as myself, when I came back, and I guess to some extent even to this day, uh, it bothers me to see waste. It may sound crazy, but I don't like to see waste when I see eating food and leaving and just and when I saw children that I was giving rations to, sea rations, uh, the, the LERPs as they call them, long range reconnaissance meal, uh, what they call MREs now, those kinds of things they were begin giving them to children in Vietnam uh, and families. The post-traumatic stress, I used to be happy turning out a faucet and getting cold water or hot water and be able to drink it right out of the, right out of the, right out of the, the spigot, right out of the uh, faucet. Uh, as opposed to having a canteen and putting an iodine tablet to drink in that water because you didn't want to get any of the other diseases. Or a warm soda, and I say warm soda, hot soda, as opposed to a can out of the refrigerator. Those kinds of things sometimes don't click with you initially. But deep down, there is something that will trigger a reaction in you and you may not even realize it. But that concept of post-traumatic stress may not be as severe as some people think of it. It may make, go off the roof and start shooting people. 
but it's internal. It may affect your life. It may affect your relationship with your family. It may affect your relationship with your children. It could affect anything and everything. You never know when it's going to come. And that's got to be recognized. When they get out and they become veterans in the sense that they're now back home and they're not in the military and the Veterans Administration, I think it's a gross, gross problem that they do not address. Gross error. They, they just do not address it properly. I know people are trying. I know there's been a lot of scandals in reference to it. But there's also a lot of wrong people on the street claiming to be Vietnam veterans who you see may be homeless or whatever. Some of the guys really do need help. But some of them take advantage of it. And I think that some of the people you will see from time to time, uh, whether they're homeless or they're begging, claiming to be veterans, uh, is not so. I don't know if that can be verified. I don't know if the VA or other people keep numbers on that situation. But I think if you spoke to other vets, they can tell, I believe I can tell if a person really was a veteran. If they're claiming to be a veteran and they're doing something like that, especially if they're from Vietnam, claim to be from Vietnam, I could ask them three or four questions and know right away if they're telling the truth. As far as anything else that I think that was important or, or uh, uh, helpful, I think a program like this and other programs need to be aired. I need, I think, interviews with some, all right, uh, a private, a captain, a general. Get them in, get them all in, individually. Collectively, sometimes we get to, we'll talk too much war stories, but get them individuals. Get a bigger, bigger spectrum of them. Uh, different branches of the service not just the Army, not just the Marines. Get some guys from the Air Force who may have flown missions, uh, or one that I, fl I flew with, uh, what was called a uh, Tonto. He was a spotter, an Air Force forward air controller, a FAC. Uh, that's a good one. That guy is flying for direct support of the troops. He's not flying a jet at 5,000, 20,000 feet and coming in and dropping a bomb. He's the guy that's flo flying treetop and marking a target with a smoke grenade or a smoke rocket, and he can get shot down a lot easier than anybody else. That kind of a guy. The guy, the pilot's crew, get some helicopter pilots. Get a medevac pilot. A medevac pilot from Vietnam, that's when the, the really the use of the helicopter for medical evacuation became, saved thousands of thousands of lives. Uh, I think not just your station here, but I think other stations throughout the country should consider doing something like this and spread it around. Share what you've got with others and let them build on it. It has to be talked about. It's a catharsis. Get it out.